After a long career in wooden boat building, I'm building a 24-foot Ranger-class gaff sloop like these ones here as my retirement project. G'day, I'm Ian Smith, and I've just finished laying the deck on my Ranger. And in this episode, I'll show you how it went. <laughs> Original ranges were built in the 1930s and 40s with solid Oregon or Douglas fir tongue and groove decks covered with cotton canvas soaked in red lead paint. Most of these have been replaced or modified by now. I diverged a bit from the fully traditional by doing it in two layers. The first layer is 10 millimetre or 3 eighths of an inch western red cedar tongue and groove glued and fastened to the deck beams with a second layer of 10 millimetre hoop pine marine plywood glued to the first layer and also fastened through to the deck beams. This is then sheathed with dynal cloth and acrylic fabric set in epoxy resin. This gives a tough and waterproof deck but retains a traditional look down below. But before I started to lay the deck there were a number of other tasks to remember. The tops of the deck beams have all got to be fared to receive the deck, as I described in episode 10. I knew the locations of the winches and deck tracks and turning blocks from the other boats in the class, so I fitted the backing pads before laying the deck for extra strength. They are let into the deck beams and glued in place. I then fared the tops of them all using a deck plank to check it. The deck lays over the stem head, which up to this point was left long and bolted to the shed to keep the hull level while building. Now that I had the hull propped underneath, I was able to cut off the stem head. I checked with marks that showed that the hull didn't move a millimetre when the excess stem was removed. I dry fitted the deck with temporary screws, staggering the few butt joints on deck beams. Before removing the planking, I marked the location of all beams and pads underneath. I lightly sanded the underside, trimmed where necessary, then taped just clear of the pencil marks because I didn't want any paint where the glue would go. Because of the limitations of space in my shed, I only removed half the deck planking and used the other half as a bench while painting, which consisted of two coats of primer, two coats of undercoat, and two coats of full gloss white. The shorter planks were done off the boat. There's a few edges to scrape and sand and plenty of tape to remove. I taped up the beams and the planking exactly on the glue line and applied West System epoxy thickened with microfibers to both the tops of the beams and the underside of the planking. and fastened each plank down with permanent bronze screws in the original screw holes and model ring nails which I could hammer straight through into the celery top deck beams but I had to drill into the spotted gum bits. 
I removed the excess glue squeeze out underneath with a putty knife and then removed the tape for a clean joint. I spent a bit of time working out where the ply overlay was going to go to minimise the length of the scarf joints I had to cut. I had no room in the shed to cut the scarfs outside the boat, so I did them on the back of the cabin. They're eight to one scarfs, that is, their width is eight times the thickness of the plywood, so 80 millimetres. I started with a power plane, but as always, finished off with a hand plane, making sure that the surface was either dead straight or very slightly hollow so the joints would lie well together. But before fitting the plywood, I checked that the deck was fair with no bumps in the cedar, starting with a hand plane and finishing with a sander. As always, I dry fitted the plywood first with temporary screws and drilled for nails every 150 millimetres or so along the deck beams. And when I was happy that all was fine, I removed it and swept and vacuumed ready for the gluing. I also drilled small relief holes in the plywood in the areas between the fastenings for excess glue to squeeze out through. I also masked and put plastic curtains around the perimeter to catch glue squeeze out. This process uses a shipload of glue. I spread the glue on the deck surface, moving it around and evening it out with a toothed spreader. I rolled unthickened epoxy on the underside of the plywood and carefully manoeuvred it into place. I fitted bronze screws where the temporary screws had been and then fitted large monol ring nails into the pre-drilled holes. temporary screws to fasten cleats along the scarf joints to spread the load evenly. I didn't notice until later unfortunately but some glue managed to squeeze down through a damaged tongue and groove joint. I trimmed the edges flush with a saw, a grinder, and a rebate plane. The rebate is about a millimetre deep, which is about the depth of the cured dynal cloth that will wrap over this edge. You might have noticed I'd left gaps around the chain plates and the Samson post in both layers. These were fitted with hue and pine packers, fitted with Sikaflex against the metal and glued everywhere else. This is so that any water that leaks in around the chain plates will only find the almost rock proof hue and pine and an impervious epoxy barrier, which is why the pieces fit loosely. A tight fit wouldn't allow enough epoxy between the surfaces. If I hadn't had hue and pine, I would have used teak. I'll also be fitting tufnel collars around each chain plate with plenty of sealant. There was a few other jobs to do before sheeting. All the exposed edges around the deck edge and hatch openings received two coats of epoxy to seal the end grain. If this isn't done, the end grain draws the epoxy out of the sheathing cloth, leaving it dry. Of course, the epoxy was scoured to remove the amine blush and sanded. The scarf joints were checked for fairness, any bumps planed off and any hollows filled. All fastening heads were also filled and the whole deck was sanded. I raided my wife's kit for the good scissors because you need very sharp scissors to cut the light vinyl cloth. It's easy to wet through dynal cloth as long as you use plenty of resin, allowing it to soak through before moving it to a dry area. It's important to move the epoxy slowly, 
Rapid movement will aerate the resin and make it more difficult to wet out the cloth. You need to remove most of the resin to newer areas without leaving the cloth too dry. Too much resin allows the cloth to float rather than stick directly to the wood. I also covered this subject when I sheathed the cockpit in episode 19. Dynel is an acrylic fabric, not as strong as fiberglass cloth, but I don't need the strength of glass. I need the strong abrasion resistance that Dynel gives. Plus, there's none of the dreaded itch you get when sanding fiberglass. I aimed for minimal overlaps. I did the whole deck over three sessions. So I sanded a feather edge on the dry cloth and laid masking tape close to the edge to make it easier to remove overlapping cloth. You can see here that the cured surface ends up about one millimetre thick. I scoured and sanded the deck, sanded the overlaps flush and added two more coats of clear epoxy to fill the weave, scouring between coats. Then I applied three coats of high build epoxy primer. I won't sand this until ready to apply the deck paint further down the track. Next, I'll be fitting the upper sponson or rub rail around the perimeter of the deck and starting on the deck furniture. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to have a squiz at my other videos on Smithy's Boat Shed channel. And check out my book on wooden boat building, available at www.sydneywoodenboatschool.com.au or off the shelf at Boat Books in Sydney and the Wooden Boat Store in Brooklyn, Maine.